Also die, äh, die Rebecca letzte Woche, die hatte 1100 Views gleich nach drei Tagen. Boah, <lacht> brutal. Ja, das war, war ja auch also, ganz erstaunlich. Das, das, das Ding ist nachher auf Facebook, also es wird aufgezeichnet ja, und ja. super, super. Und ist auf Facebook. Ja. Ja, wir sind, wir sind sogar schon im Livestream. Sehe ich gerade. So, we should stop to talking. <laughs> yeah, and uh, make a serious face or put our yeah. Uh, yeah. screen on. Yeah. <laughs> I will be admitting um, the participants now. Okay. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, hi. Hi, good afternoon. Hi. Okay, um, Dr. Pavlik, we may begin when you're ready. Okay, thank you, Aido. Okay. So, hello and welcome everyone. Warm greetings from the TRACES laboratory here at the RIT in Ateneo de Manila University. This is our second webinar that will present current research and new discoveries in archaeology and paleoecology. I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Miriam Noel Heidle from the Heidelberg Academy of Sciences and Humanities and the University of Tübingen. Dr. Miriam Heidle is a Paleolithic archaeologist and paleoanthropologist who received her doctoral degree in 1996 and habilitation in 2006 from the Eberhard Karls University Tübingen in Germany. Dr. Heidle is a longtime friend and colleague, and we were actually classmates back then in Tübingen at the Institute of Prehistory. She has worked and researched in Europe, Africa, and in Southeast Asia. Between 1997 and 2006, she taught as a visiting professor at the Royal University of Fine Arts in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. And from 2005 to 2007, she worked as visiting researcher at Aarhus University in Denmark. Since 2008, Dr. Heidel is the scientific coordinator of the research center, The Role of Culture in Early Expansions of Humans, or ROCKI. ROCKI is a very dynamic program that has worked across disciplines from the very beginning. And it systematically traces human evolution and dispersal from the starting point in Africa and then across Europe and Asia. Her research focuses on cultural and cognitive evolution and how this can be inferred from animal tool behavior and archaeological artifacts. I would also like to introduce our respondent for this webinar, Professor Emeritus Dr. Fernando Schalzita of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology of Ateneo de Manila University. Dr. Schalzita is a most distinguished anthropologist and cultural historian. He is the program director of the Ateneo Social and Cultural Laboratory and heads the Cultural Heritage Studies and Encounters Project. 
Dr. Schalzita is a prolific speaker and writer and winner of the National Book Award. I can highly recommend his excellent magisterial lecture on the Age of Enlightenment, which was recorded right here at the RIT. On behalf of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and the Anthropological and Sociological Initiatives of the Ateneo, I like to thank the people and institutions that made this webinar series possible. The members of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, the School of Social Sciences, the Office of the Vice President for University and Global Relations, Kalipunang Sociologia at Anthropologia, Arete, the Creativity and Innovation Hub of the Ateneo de Manila University, and the Eduardo J. Aboites Sandbox Zone. Now, without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Miriam Heidle and her talk on the dawn of culture, sociality, thinking in loops, and an extended resource space. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alfred, for this very, very nice introduction. So I will try to share my screen, which is here. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah, looks good. Good, looks good. Okay, the dawn of culture, sociality, thinking in loops and an extended resource space. This is, uh, this talk is just based on research, which I have done, which I've done now for 20 years, I have to say, yes. Um, for 20 years, not only by myself, but also together with the Rocky team, as Alfred Pavlik already introduced, the role of culture in early expansions of humans. Now, let's start. What do we mean by culture? Here you can see an array of different things, which probably everyone could uh, realize as culture. Of course, there is philosophers, there are, there are written books from the medieval time, there is classical music, but also jewelry and ornaments by uh, Indian people in South America. There is the culture of food, the culture, the architectural culture, dance, reading, garden culture, fan culture. There are a lot of things to which culture is connected and which uh, probably are, yeah, not, not so much uh, controversial in being seen as culture. But is this culture too? What those two chimpanzees do, those over, overhead hand clasp grooming or the thing what the uh, person in Germany is doing, gathering different uh, bottles to bring them back to the supermarket and gain some, some money. Is this culture too? We had a long discussion in our project over the last years uh, in just seeing yeah, what culture really is. And this is our result. We try to combine, uh, on the one hand, ethological data from animal observations and archaeological data, because uh, there is a big discussion, not only in cultural uh, sciences, but also in biological sciences, in ethology, what really culture is. And as we are dealing with human evolution from 3 million years to 20,000 years ago in our project, it was obvious for us that we also have to include the very beginnings of culture. And therefore, we already thought, yeah, we should integrate also biology and their uh, observations about culture. And so we formed a sort of, um, a sort of, overlap for the for the whole cultural thing so that we can really integrate the evolution of culture from our primate beginnings to the culture we have today. 
And this is what we found out. We just define culture as cultural performances, as a set of cultural performances with historical social dimension of development. And this is the crucial thing, the historical social dimension, which differs cultural behavior and cultural performances from other only biological or individual performances. So it must be socially transmitted within a group and maintained in a certain time depth. And as you can see uh, at the bottom, there is very simple things like social information, which is, for example, if crowds look at other crowds where they are, where they have their sleeping places in trees and they share this sleeping place or where they can find something to eat. Social learning is something with a little bit more time depth. So bees, for example, learn from other bees where there are flowering uh, trees or some uh, yeah some flowering trees but this is only for rather short time depth so it's not really a historical thing traditions in contrast are things which are transmitted socially transmitted within a group but maintained over generations and the combination of those are basic uh, is basic culture or basic cultural capacities, as we call them, because we don't want to talk about culture per se. And probably in the uh, long run of this talk, you will understand why we don't want to talk about culture as one monolith. OK, so the very, uh, the very important thing here on this slide is the historical social dimension, which for us defines cultural performances in different grades. And then starting from this, we get on with modular, composite, complementary and notional, notional capacities, which define the very thing, very end. As you can see, the historical dimension is increasing. The evolu evolutionary biological dimension is also increasing, but not in the same grade, uh, in the same on the same level as historical social dimension. This is increasing more. This in is increasing less with each step. And what you can see also is that it's not only a thing like getting up, getting up, getting up, and letting all the other things behind, but every new grade is integrating the grades before. So, of course, if you have modular behavior, modular cultural capacities, you also uh, possess basic cultural capacities, traditions, social learning and social information and so on. OK, this was one of the main results we uh, just came out with after a long discussion at a conference we organized in 2011. So, great ape culture, to get to this point. The primatological perspective is that there is a differential concept. Uh, this is a pragmatic approach to detect culture. You can look at several groups, as, we, as uh, White et al. did in nature. Oh, I see that there is something probably cut out, uh, as you can see here. In different groups in uh, chimpanzees, they looked at what the chimpanzees do, which different sort of behaviors they have, and they compared it, those different things, and looked at if those have, those chimpanzee groups have the same environmental condi conditions, but differ in behavior, then they counted it as a cultural trait. You can see it in White et al. in nature. Yep. The problem is that with this perspective, that a lot of people just looked at it as, OK, if the same environmental conditions, if you have this but different behavior, you have a cultural trait. But what is about having, a, do you have also a cultural trait if you have 
uh, or is it is it necessary for cultural trade also to have same environmental conditions but different behavior? And only in 2019, Shubli and Van Schaik published their view for uh, great apes that the reverse conclusion is, of course, not allowed. It can be that also you have the same environmental conditions and the same behavior. And of course, it can be also a cultural trait. And this is very important for us because uh, we already thought before that it's not that crucial always looking at the same environmental conditions and uh, different behavior and only then you have culture but culture is really defined by those transmissions uh, social trans transmissions between different individuals and over generations if we look at chimpanzee culture, I just only want to give you some small examples to see what they really have. So chimpanzees rely on traditions to solve new tasks. There were experiments, you can see the pictures on the right, for honey extraction. Experiments were made with two different groups, the Kanyavara group of Kibale, Uganda, and the Sonso group of Budongo, also in Uganda. These are neighboring groups. And the upper group, the Kanyavara group, uh, has a twig culture. And the Sonso group prob uh, just solves most of their problems with leaves. And the big question of those experiments of Gruber et al. were, what do groups with a really uh, fixed culture do if they are just shown new problems. The new problem wa was how to extract honey from an apparatus. And the question was just observing what will they do. Of course, it was much easier uh, to get the honey out with the twigs and the Kanyavara group, of course, did it. The Sonso group also had twigs. But even if they were shown how to do it with twigs, they just uh, kept their leaf culture. And as you see here, the result, they still try to do this. So it doesn't depend on what is easier or what not, but what has been learned before, what to do. But chimpanzees can also adopt new traditions. Female chimpanzees, for example, showed that they adopt new traditions when they are changing the group. So it is very important to keep this in mind that it is really a social thing. A lot of things are social, socially mediated, what they do. And uh, it depends very much on what the others in the group are doing and that you also want to stay with a group in just keeping their norm and not introducing your own. If we look at uh, the paleoanthropological perspective, of course, we have a very big range. You can see the red arrow and the bot at the bottom. This shows the extension of human tool use 3.3 million years ago. It starts up to now. And at that time, there are a lot of different uh, species, hominin species, which are probable or likely tool users. So, of course, even if uh, not all of them, of all Australopithecines and also of all uh, paanthropine species probably have been tool users, we can say that there is nothing like the human culture. There are a lot of different species which used probably tools. And as you can see, the red arrow here starts at 3.3 million years at a time for which we don't have any homo fossils. So it's very, very likely that already Australopithecus and probably also Paanthropus used tools even if not in that extent as Homo developed it in the further run. 
one big discussion we had uh, in our project, at least with outsiders, is okay, but material culture is this really culture? What can you see from this? And this is a very big thing. If you are looking at engraved ostrich eggshells, for example, from deep cloth, which are around 60,000 years old, 65,000 years old, you could say, okay, this, what is this? These are artifacts, we can count them as artifacts, but what has it really to do with culture, with, with traditions? Oops, so like this. But what is behind, of course, all those artifacts is that they are material expressions of performances. You can see here a picture from Bushman in Africa using an ostrich egg as a water container. And if we find those fragments of ostrich eggshell containers, then we probably can see something like this behind. Of course, we have problems to really see the details behind, but it should be our aim to look behind the artifacts in getting scenes like this reconstructed also for our old artifacts. And this is the huge endeavor we are trying with our Rocky project. Now, we have 3 million, 3.3 million year old evidence of artifacts, as I can show you here, the stone tools from La Mekwi at Kenya, they were only published in 2015, so rather young. And these are rather crude artifacts, but they are very, very important because they push back those uh, thoughts about tool use, about human tool use beyond our range of homo and also beyond the range uh, where we thought tool use really started for uh, stone tool use started for hominins. We can infer, of course, that also early hominins use tools as chimpanzees probably, uh, as chimpanzees do with twigs and also with stones hammering something open. We, as we can see it here, for example, there are even capuchin monkeys using stones. There are chimpanzees using stones and other tools, for example, to crack open nuts. And also chimpanzees can be trained to nap stones. But the big question is, what is the difference? It looks rather similar if we have just a rough look on this. But what is really the big difference between these stone tools we see on the left and those behaviors which we see here? We looked at this uh, in an article uh, cognition from capuchin rock pounding to Lomacvian flake production, which Mali's Lombard, Anders Höberg and I published in 2019. So the big thing is that tool use is a thinking in loops. So the first point from the title. Thinking in loops can be very easily explained. If you look at the gazelle, this animal is just in uh, eating as soon as it has, as it is feels hungry. So it's a direct food intake without any tools, without any things in between. If you feel hungry, you just bow your neck and eat. Bah, easy. If you look at the chimpanzee, if this animal wants to crack open such a panda nut, then there is a problem, of course, because it cannot just easily get to this fruit and just have it, but it has to stop first. It has to think about, it has to take a tool, has to find a tool and only gets to the fruit then to its real aim, to its real target, and then opens this nut with a, with a tool. So there is a delay. It's not just a 
direct food intake, but it's a delay. The action has to be stopped. The mind has to be turned. The perception has to be turned to something else. And then coming back to the main target. Chimpanzees uh, extend this also. They probably, uh, they, for example, also use multi-component set of primary tools uh, to gather ants or to extract termites or honey. There is a very nice example from chimpanzees opening termite mounds, first with big sticks, with hard sticks, producing larger holes, and then taking small and fine twigs, elastic twigs, which they brought with them. And this is important. So it's not just a trial and error thing, but they just come to the termite mount with two tools uh, at their hands. First, the big stick pounding the mount, and then the fine twig just to insert into the newly made holes and to extract the termites and eat them. But and this is very important. Both tools are just applied to one and the same target. So there is only one target in mind. Now, what do we have with those stone tools, those napped stone tools? And this is quite a very interesting thing, because here we have another, a different extension of thinking in loops. Chimpanzees and some other animals can use two tools on one target. This is already an extension, but probably only Homo, at least what we what we can see up to now, only uh, hominins can use a tool to produce a tool and then to apply it on one target. So this is really a further step. This is what is to be said, secondary tool use. Now, what uh, is the special thing with secondary tool use? It's a decoupling of problem and solution. It's, it's a decoupling of problem and solution and a segmentation of the behavioral sequence is possible. So you are not only having one target in your mind, but you have two targets or even more targets in your mind. The first thing is you have to look for raw material and you have to look for a tool to produce the other tool. For example, a napped stone tool, a flake, uh, a hand axe, whatsoever. And then with this hand axe at hand, you can approach another target. You can approach a target which you had in mind, or you can approach a target which you had not in mind and uh, do something else with it. This segmentation of behavioral sequence or modularization, as we call it, allows small bits which are much easier to be learned. You can learn, for example, first how to cut with this cutting tool produced by someone else, or you can uh, learn how to how to produce tools and leave it behind what what will be done with it. So you can just distribute your learning things by having smaller bits. The modules can also be distributed between several individuals. For example, if uh, one is not so, uh, not really very much able in napping tools. You can use tools napped by someone else and do this, do your own uh, thing with a nap tool already. Or there is someone who is very good in napping, but rather old. And so he can just ask someone to or just get someone to carry, for example, the raw material. This is something which we don't observe in primates so far. Of course, uh, research is still uh, really uh, yeah, very, very intensive in this respect. So probably we know something like this in the future. But so far, we don't see those things in primates that, for example, 
different uh, tasks are distributed. Different tasks aiming at one target distributed between several individuals. This is probably, this is my hypothesis, only possible due to the segmentation of behavioral sequence based on secondary tool use, based on this uh, decoupling of problem and solution. Inventions are facilitated by recombination of modules. Of course, if you have a napped stone tool, you don't have to really apply it only on the body of a dead gazelle, but you can also, for example, carve some wood with it or something else. So if it's not really completely bound to one target, invention is much more facilitated. And there is a hierarchical combination possible, which fosters the increase of complexity. This means you can use different, uh, different segments, different modules, which you can combine to get more and more complex things. So how do we see this in the material? Looking at the LOMECV, we see potential modularization. This is a special representation of uh, those tool uses. It's a sort of uh, reverse engineering, rather similar to Chen Laboratoire, but with a little bit more information in it. So you don't have to understand the details. It's a coding of all the different behaviors needed to produce those stone tools from Lamequi, which you can see in the middle in module A. And module B here is the use then. So production of the tools is in module A, use of the tools is in module B. We cannot really prove it from the Lamequi record if there is this modularization already, but it is rather likely that it is at least possible. Okay. If we look only, yeah, <laughs> only one million year later at Lokalalai 2C, um, I have just get a little bit into detail about Lokalalai 2C. Lokalalai 2C was for a long time quite at the beginning of stone tool use, which was for a long time seen as around 2.6 million years. So Lokalalai 2C was only shortly later than the beginning of the older one or pre older one things. Now, in the meantime, as we have Lomekwi, it's already one million year later. But here in Lomekwi, we really see big process uh, progress in processing stones and manufacture of stone tools. So here you see uh, some refittings from Lokalalai. This is the refitting group 35. They have several of them. And here at this site, which is a very special site, they had up to uh, 73, to be correct, 73 refittings or reconstructions of elements from one nodule. So there is really a serial production of uh, different things. And as this site is really very, very well documented and very, very well preserved, it is, of course, uh, it can be reconstructed that the raw material was not at the site, but transported there. This is module one, at least. Acquisition of raw material and transport to another locality, which is locality, locality, locality 2C. And then we have the fragmentation, the block fragmentation and production of flake series from core A and B, module two, whoops, module two here. And then another thing, the selection and transport of flakes from core A and B to locality C to use the flakes. Because this is also clear from all the re refittings made at Lokalalai that a lot of flakes have been transported to different uh, spots. So what we have here is 
the minimum reconstruction of modularization from this refitting group uh, 35 from Lokalalai. This is uh, what probably can also be within this. So we just gave, uh, it's Malise Lombard, Anders Heuberg and me working on this. This is just our reconstruction, what might be possible within only refitting group 35. And this is one of the smaller refitting groups. It can be a very simple variant, variant A with only three modules, but it can be also within this material variant D with up to eight different modules. The acquisition of raw material at one uh, locality, which is in yellow, then the transport of the raw material to locality B, the search for hammerstone and block fragmentation, production of uh, flake series from core A, another module from core B later on, then the first transport to one locality, locality C, therefore in violet. Here, selection and transport, and probably later on the use there of flakes from core A. And coming back to locality B at module six, the next production, getting away from this side to another spot and use the flakes in module eight. Of course, this is only a, a reconstruction and a potential reconstruction. It can be as easy as variant A, but this is the possibility which those reconstructions which we have at Locala Light to see allow. And you can see there is a huge uh, range of modularization already in. This thinking in loops is connected with an extended resource space and sociality. Why? How does it, how do we have this? We have to get back to the development of cultural performances. And this is developed in three dimensions in interaction with a specific environment. Of course, you saw this before. You have here, if you see this cube, the, which is the cultural performance with these three dimensions of development, the ontogenetic individual, the evolutionary biological dimension and the historical social dimension, which defines it as a cultural performance. You have already this. And this historical social dimension brings in, of course, the sociality. And there were some aspects I already said when looking at the secondary tool use slide that it is possible due to this uh, segmentation that different people come in, that learning is easier, but that you are learning different bits and that there is more complexity getting in. And all this is also connected with a historical social dimension which I will get into detail. But all this development is also connected to the specific environment, the specific environment of conspecifics, how many and in which role and server, but also of agent and objects because you are producing more and more objects, the relations to those uh, conspecific and objects, and also the time depths in which you can think. Because of course it takes longer and longer and longer, those things. If you are thinking of local light to see, if you are taking raw material from a source, for example, only two or three kilometers away, but not at the site itself, it takes some time to bring it here. You have to nap your different sets of artifacts, of uh, flakes, and then you are taking them to one other spot and probably come back and take it to a third spot and so on. And this, you can see there is a much bigger time of planning, even if in our modern human things, in our, our modern human ways, it's still rather small, but there is compared to chimpanzees, to great apes, a big extension of time depth also in. And it's time depth, 
of course, uh, to the present, uh, to the future, but also to the past. Okay, how does this develop? We have material engagement as one thing. Things afford a certain engagement. Of course, uh, you have something like a pebble, a knife or a container, which is which can be quite easy to be used uh, or where it is clear how it can be used. Uh, for us, it's clear, of course, but which makes it easy to be used as this. If you have a flake, for example, you have a cutting edge which can easily hurt your finger. So you can just see, okay, this is, this is something which uh, brings things, things apart, which is sharp, which do things. And so it is just affording and just trying out to use it in a different way. Performances develop through material engagement. Performance is also like napping. If you do not try how to get off a flake from a stone, you will not see it. It's not, uh, so this was not developed by just thinking and reflecting about it, but only by trying out. How are the physical, uh, facilities which a thing is showing what, what can it do, what can it not do, and so on. And the sense making develops only through performances. Of course, if you already have a lot of sense uh, making about different things, you also can reflect on other things. But in the beginning, the sense making can only develop through performances. And uh, the resource space is extending and it's also an extending learning environment. Tools preserve, for example, a range of purposes, intended elements, design, techniques of manufacture and use. So it's a scaffold for further engagement. If you are looking at a bicycle, of course, even if no person is around, uh, you can easily just look at it and turn the wheel and get some things and probably you can see the seat and uh, think about mm, should be that you sit on it. It's of course much easier if another person is just running with the bike so can you can try out and just get about this. But it's the same thing also if you're looking at stone tools. They if you see persons using them, it's quite easy just to get what they can do. But even if no person is there, they are enriching the environment. It's not only normal stone, but it's stone which was made with a sort of intention and which still shows some uh, some qualities, some new qualities, which were produced, like, for example, the sharp edges, which uh, are allowing to use it in a different way than an unmanufactured stone. So all those tools produced are enriching the environment in just uh, giving some, some new possibilities to perform with the environment, to say. And of course, the social engagement is very important. Great apes already are very social beings which learn from one another. And uh, group members also afford a certain engagement as, for example, as models of performances or as partners of interaction. Performances also develop through social engagement. You can see here a small child, which is just even listening to some explanations how a stone tool can be used. But even if you don't have language, but only see it as small chimpanzees do, just looking over the shoulder of their mother and just watching how, for example, a nut can be cracked and trying a small nut which has been opened by the mother, then sense making also develops slowly, slowly, slowly. So it's those two things which are more and more uh, fostering this 
loop thinking because uh, the loop thinking is getting more and more uh, opaque also. It's not so easy to get from the beginning to the right end from the first uh, problem you have until really solving the problem and having the solution. But if you have those small bits, it's getting much easier if you have some and if you have a lot of those small bits, it's much easier the more people you have to learn from. I will just show you how this uh, enrichment of specific environment really uh, yeah, works, for example. And I will show you this with an example engagement with fire. So we had the group members as environment, the agent, agents and objects, which means resources, but also uh, competitors, but also tools, raw materials, and those things are all within this agents and objects group. There are the relations you have with each other, and there's the time depth. If we look uh, for engagement with fire, the beginning is just watching a bushfire. Chimpanzees are doing this. They are not fleeing the fire, but they are still next to fire, observing it, and also sometimes taking advantage of it in getting through uh, areas where it is much easier, for example, when they are burned, where there are not that many shrubs or high vegetation. So they are even using landscape modified by fire. If you have a relocation of fire, which might be the first step taken by hominins to act with fire, at least you need some stick to relocate a bit of fire taken from bushfire. So the specific environment in this interaction with fire is already enriched by taking something else, which, is, which gets part of your resource base. You take a stick as a resource. If you want to maintain fire, it already pops up. New things get into your uh, scope of perception. For example, dead trees, which probably have not been really part of your interest things. But now, as you need some fuel for your fire, they might get very interesting. You need people also to bring those dead branches and dead twigs to the fire to really maintain it. And of course, it can be a, a lot of, there can be a lot of difference if you maintain fire, fire uh, a lot of interactions with your groups and just sitting around the fire and so on. So the specific environment is much increasing. If you are able to conserve fire, this means if you are really uh, taking advantage of fire at nearly at your will, and you are not only relying on some natural fire, which has to be maintained, but if you really can take it from one spot to another spot, several kilometers away, for example, then you can rely on it and really also have this on a regular basis. Things like cooking, things like uh, technical uh, use of fire, for example, in just uh, tempering some, some tools or in also some producing something like bird farm. And the big thing then is the production of fire, where some completely different things come into your mind also. This is you need new raw material as tool to produce fire, but you can also produce completely new items like ceramics or other things. And you can uh, use also the fire to change your landscape, for example, for landscape management. So you can see there is a lot of things which are getting into this. The group members are getting more and more important because there are a lot of new skills. Whoops. 
there are a lot of new skills brought in, which you have to learn and which you have to maintain within a group. There are a lot of new agents and objects, not only the fuel, but also some other things which can get into your scope, like uh, things which have to be cooked, like new materials which have to be thing like uh, which have to be thought of, or things like this. And you are also changing your relations to different things. Okay, what we see is that there is more and more an amalgamation of domains. In the beginning, it's rather small, our ecological setting. The individual is having a little bit of social engagement with other group members, a little bit of material engagement with the resources, but the overlap in the middle is rather small. On the right hand, you can see the extension of the ecological setting. The individual is not doing many things anymore, only uh, by himself, but either in engagement with other group members or in engagement with some material, with the resources. And the overlap, this interdomain engagement between group members and resources is getting broader and broader. And this is how we are today. So in most of the things we are engaging with resources and with other group members. We learn those things with other group from other group members. We are engaging with other group members in doing something and so on. So the this is the main thing, this amalgamation, this inter-domain engagement is increasing, uh, is increasing due to the very beginning of this small segmentation thing, the modularization. Another example of cultural expansion, just showing to you, of course, this is nothing uh, what we have at the very beginning, at the dawn of culture, <clears throat> but it just shows you on how our uh, engagement with other persons and with the environment is really exploding in the run of human evolution. If we look at simple clothing, you can see uh, you need only the or only the acquisition of obsidian and of hammerstone to nap some tools. You found a dead uh, animal or hunted it somehow. You had uh, some hide. You need to scrape it with those tools to get the meat off. And you have to soften it somehow, taking another tool cutting it, and then you have some hides which you can just throw over your shoulder. So there are already a lot of different things you have to learn, a lot of different performances, but it's still rather easy. If you have composite clothing, this means uh, something which is composed of different elements, hides, for example, uh, just taken together by some threads. You have those things from the beginning, the acquisition of obsidian and hammerstone to nap some tools, which you probably need for the first time to get some bone or also to work on some bone for whittling or polishing afterwards to get some oil. All, uh, uh, alls you need, for example, for piercing the hides afterwards. Then, of course, if you want to sew different hides together, you need some fibers. Taken here, some sinew. You also need a hammerstone to prepare the sinew. You have to process it. And then you have those threads. You need the hide, which we had before. And then you bring everything together. You are piercing the hides. You have some small holes in it where you can put the thread through and just bring these things together. So there are a lot of different performances in this thing. And it's still only very simple composite clothing. If you then already 
think of a, a really tailored suit, complex clothing, the range is even more broader. You have, for example, not only alls, but also some needles made. Probably you are not only taking sinew, but also some plant fibers, which have to be twisted, spinned, or even dyed. And you also need, of course, the raw materials for this. You have probably even some decoration. So you need to have some snails, some pigments, which you have to process by perforating, coloring, blah, blah, blah. You have to tailor those things. So you have to have a pattern how to cut those different parts. And then you sew all those things together using, using those different elements and uh, even decorate it in the beginning. So the material engagement is getting is really exploding. There are a lot of different uh, performances included and no one person can do all those things uh, in the same in the same way, in the same quality to say. And of course, you cannot just only learn all those things by looking at something uh, in the end, but you really have to learn it from other individuals. So there is a lot of material engagement in know-how, practice, of course, you have to try and do it again and again. Uh, the relationships are different between all those things. There is a lot of development and maintenance and transfer of uh, different ideas. And the social engagement has to increase uh, to a very, very large extent to get all those things managed to have complex clothing, clothing in the end. So this has a result then also on the dynamics of human resources. What we have at the dawn of human culture, for example, is the increasing amount of faculties just on the top. Within the group, the amount of faculties is increasing in just uh, finding good raw material, for example, knowing where to have this in uh, processing, in napping tools, in applying those stone tools and so on. In the longer run, and probably also what we have at uh, Locala Light to see, we might have a differentiation of expertise, an individual differentiation of expertise. Some people might be much more able to nap, for example, large series of stone tools as we have those in Locala Light to see. Others are probably more uh, the users. So as we are not, most of us are not the producers of computers, but we are only the users. There might be even though uh, at that point, some people which we are much more able to produce stone tools and some which were just tolerated in also taking some other, some tools from the others. And then there is a step which up to now, we are not sure where we really get this at which point of human evolution we get this, a differentiation of assigned roles, which is a thing between the individual and the group, a differentiation of assigned roles by others. So you are the one to nap the tools. I am the one to uh, chase away, for example, uh, some competitors from the prey. And the third one is the one to dissect the prey. And this, these differentiation of assigned rules then would be the basis, the foundation of special specialization and of real cooperation in having really those roles clearly made and working together. And all those then in the end is an, brings an increase of flexibility and plasticity in activities and responses. We have human resources as resources of labor, real work, of tradition in 
keeping in mind how to do some things, of experience also, and of management. And so bringing all this together, we can see the cultural universe of hominins behind those artifacts. There are a lot of different things of learning behind, of practice, of planning. The know-how is getting more and more important. Technologies, fixed technologies, or uh, rather strict technologies. Raw materials, as I showed, are getting more and more important. The different raw materials, different tools also, which are applied to other tools and so on. The social interaction is getting more and more important. And this has also influence also on how we are dealing with our competitors. Competitors within our group, but also competitors outside the group. It has some importance in uh, how those hominins get got access to food, for example. And it had some uh, influence also on the mobility. Raw material, for example, was taken more and more from some distance. And so they didn't only shift their place uh, looking for new food, but they were also probably shifting sometimes place for looking for some different raw materials. So the whole use of the landscape changed. And probably in the end, the group structure also changed. In the end, I want to give you a scenario on an early human scenario between three and two million years to get back to uh, our main aim in the beginning. As I showed you, we have an expanding thinking in loops with new possibilities and requirements. This uh, thinking in loops, this getting away from uh, the very, very easy one target, probably increased social sociality and the social engagement. It expanded the resource base and also the material engagement. And all those things expanded the learning environment. If we have this scene, you can see uh, different hominins chasing away a saber cat from its prey. And this is something which is not only a fiction of a painter, which are of a designer, which is which just uh, thought of something like this. But we have a lot of traces on animal uh, remains at that time that people were also chasing away leopards or probably leopards or other large cats from their prey to get some uh, some parts of their prey, some remains of their prey. So humans just entered a new niche to say like this. Of course, or not only of course, it's only a rather a recent uh, discovery that also chimpanzees sometimes chase away leopards from their prey. But uh, humans just did this in a very, uh, in a much more effective way. We see a lot of evidence about this. Um, at least some, some evidence, more evidence as we see it in chimpanzees to say that uh, humans did this. And this is also a thing of uh, having more plans. It's not just only coming by chance, uh, coming by by chance and then chasing away this leopard, but you at least need some sticks, you need some stones, you need something to throw, for example, on the leopard to throw it, uh, to chase it away. And if you then don't have your stone tools, your flake tools with you, you cannot dissect anything from this prey. This means you have to take those things with you somehow handheld, and then you are able to get some of the prey. It also needs a rather large group 
relying on each other and working together. So some are dissecting, not all probably are dissecting, some are chasing, some are looking uh, for, for other competitors and things like this. So the group is working more and more together in bringing different materials with them, stones to chase, sticks to chase, tools to dissect afterwards, and also in learning. And this expands also the resource space. For example, not only the raw material needed for all those things, but also the things got from the environment as meat from the prey, or also uh, bone marrow, which is also a completely new thing which hominins uh, developed to do to crack open large bones with stones to extract the marrow, which is a high energy uh, food. Good. Okay, there are more and more things to be learned, even if it looks still like uh, this is just a primate scene. But as I just reported to you now, there are more and more elements to be learned in this environment. And all this had also some influence not only on our cultural evolution, but also on our, our biological uh, evolution. Of course, as you can see in our tooth, the whole uh, chewing apparatus, for example, changed by using tools. So we were not so much relying on these sharp and large tools, but had smaller tools. Our hands were adapted to tool use. And of course, uh, our whole uh, brain uh, nervous system more and more developed in this area facilitated, for example, by those high energy food intake, which was possible, but also uh, by, the, by the need uh, of more nervous system, of more learning and of more social contacts we have. So it's a thing which uh, where a lot of components interact. The social engagement, the material engagement, the enrichment of the resource base is interacting with our uh, biological evolution. And of course, the biological evolution is again affording or scaffolding more cultural evolution. Now, this is the last slide. One of the big things uh, in the end is, is all this cultural evolution a story of continuous progress? Is it getting up, up, up and from the start 3.3 million years? Or is it probably not so much progress, but path dependency what we see. And this is a different view on adaptability. The ratchet effect is a very, uh, very prominent interpretation of what was going on in human evolution. So that we learned from the cultural success of the others, and we are just improving step by step our performances. And there was no way back, like in the ratchet, it was up, up, up. We learned even more by the, uh, the things what was good and what was not so good by our uh, conspecifics. Another model, which I prefer, is the mountaineering model, which was developed by Marlies Lombard. And this says that it's not so much a thing of getting up, up, up. Because everything which we develop has normally, every invention, every innovation has normally good effects and not so good side effects to say. So there are a lot of factors which have to be uh, taken in mind. So something, for example, it's uh, very good if you have to if you have fire but of course uh, you also have to look for the fuel and you have to engage more of your time to get the fuel for example 
So therefore, there are a lot of different sides of any innovation. And the more complex the innovations get, the more complex also these good and bad effects uh, are shaping a, a sort of effect network. And so the mountaineering model says, OK, taking any path which you are an innovation is showing you just a sort of new landscape, which gives you a new perspective and which can lead you to completely different ways. It can also lead you up. It can lead you to the side, but it can also lead you down here, for example, to a dead end again. And this is just my final slide in just uh, leaving you behind, not with a progress story, but with a rather complex story of human cultural evolution and of human development. Of course, it's a picture also of climbing up, of getting more and more complex, of having more and more elements in, of getting a broader view the more you get up the hill. But of course, it's a rather difficult landscape with getting down, getting to the side, getting uh, straight up or getting to completely different ways. And each step which you reached allows you to get into completely different directions, depending on your environment, depending on those people helping you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Heidler, for this really wonderful lecture, uh, brilliantly presented and illustrated, and, and giving us so many intriguing aspects of, of behavior uh, and, and environmental social interactions, and, and really so many takeaways. So thank you very much for that. I will now uh, hand over directly to our distinguished uh, respondent, Dr. Schalzita, please. Thank you for inviting me to respond. Actually, I don't know where to start because uh, the lecture is just so impressive. I like, I like how it starts from the simple and shows how complexity emerges from the simple. Um, let me just focus on a few points though. I like the emphasis on the importance of, of history and time because uh, as a cultural anthropologist, I'm always interested, of course, in how culture began when. But here, um, yes, we know that uh, the great apes use twigs to extract uh, uh, termites from mounds. But here you brought in another, and that actually uh, this can be taught to others. Um, but you emphasize the importance of um, transmit, uh, time depth. In other words, it's not enough to simply spread knowledge of this in the group. The group has to uh, become dependent on this acquired knowledge. So that, that for me is a very important uh, distinction to make. Um, uh, it's not enough for, for knowledge to be just momentary. It has to become a sort of tradition within a group. Uh, that for me is uh, quite, quite a novel insight indeed. The other thing I wanted to, to bring up is that I like the, the emphasis on performance, the, the fact that um, um, primates are, are agentive, they, they act as agents, especially so hominins. So you pointed out that actually um, constantly there's performance. And in this performance, there are loops. Um, Desire is always mediated. It's, not, it's never um, attained once and for all immediately. Desire is performed. Uh, and then uh, there's a postponement of the desire because it's important um, for the agent to perceive a series of means for attaining the end. That for me was another interesting insight. 
And then the third thing was that was you showed how these loops actually generate increasing interactivity um, with, with uh, other members of the group, with the environment, and also with previous knowledge. So you, you showed how complexity unfolds from uh, the, sim uh, the very simple act. Um, I have a question though, in terms of uh, um, mediation, I've always been intrigued by the, by the fact that some animals, not primates, uh, seem to be able to postpone uh, ful fulfillment of desire. For example, um, ravens have been observed to, to get nuts, drop them into the sidewalk, let the sidewalk crack the nuts open, and then they swoop down to eat the contents of the nuts. Uh, at the same time, in the Philippines, for example, we have a crab that is known to climb up the coconut tree to cut the cut cut the coconut from its uh, from its branch and then drop it to the to the beach and then the uh, the crab scurries down the side of the coconut tree to to eat the coconut which has been <laughs> cracked by the beach doesn't that show mediation isn't isn't yeah. performance here being used as a kind of tool for attaining uh, or attaining an end. Yes, yes. Uh, we we uh, now the word is lacking. Um, we we are discriminating between tool use and uh, proto tool use and those things which uh, the crab is doing, for example, or the crow which is uh, throwing a nut on the ground or something like this, is a sort of proto tool use because mm -hmm. they are not handling those things. Okay. But uh, in the end, it's it's just a sort of definition, okay. which uh, the mainly the ethologist just brought in. So in the cognitive way, it's just nearly the same thing. You are using something to make some to make a change in what you what you want to do and yes of course i see it uh, with a crab they are throwing it down it cracks open they they are getting down uh it can be that it is uh, such a proto tool use on the other hand they probably are not uh, not able to eat it on the <laughs> on the top of the tree um but they are still only facing at one target and this is the big big thing the big difference thank you thank you very much That's all I, have to say. I thank you for your comments thank you very much for the lecture thank you very much dr schalzita um i think we we are nearing the end but we may have time for a couple of questions uh, from our audience. Hello, um, Dr. Heidle. I'll probably ask one question or two. Um, this is from Mr. Bryce Agdipa from uh, Ramon Magsaysay State University. Um, he asks, what is the role of language in the dawn of culture? Ah, this is a very good question. The role of culture is, uh, the role of language is probably only developing through all those things. Uh, due to sociality, due to the need to really uh, learn from other individuals, we have probably more and more communication but it is not at the beginning. So when we look at chimpanzees, for example, or other great apes, we probably only have things like uh, habituation. This means you are just going to the same food places with your parents and therefore you learn about those, those food places. Or you are uh, watching the role model as the mother is knocking uh, is opening a nut, you learn as a small chimpanzee also what is in a nut and how it probably can be can be done. But 
what we don't have or what it seems not to be in great apes is a direct teaching a direct uh yeah showing something there might be small things like chimpanzee's mother turning turning some nuts in a better position so it's more easy to be to be neck knocked uh to be napped but not really a, a sort of teaching in like taking the hand and so you, you have to nap it in this way or something like this and this is something which has to happen first before more and more communication comes that there is a turn that uh, two individuals are really referring to one thing yeah so the mother refers to the same nut as the child is referring to and i think of course we cannot prove it archaeologically i think that it is a very slow process that more and more utterances for example get into this learning process so the mother or the father is just uh, doing comments like this or, no no or like, yeah 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 to, just to uh, improve the child in doing the performance or also to to keep the motivation high the longer the learning process is motivation is also a very crucial thing i think if you think of chimpanzees needing three years to be proficient in nut cracking uh, you can imagine how long it might take really to be proficient in napping stones uh, if you tried it yourself you know it's not that easy and to be really proficient in it to do things like those people 2.3 million years in locala light to see performed it needs some time and probably it needs some motivation also from outside and that's mm, go on go on yeah and so there are probably in the beginning small utterances like mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, or Ooh, no then there are probably uh, utterances on some items and more and more these get connected with uh, the, yeah probably connected due to uh, or with with the help of some verbs or something like this bring it to me or get away or something like this and yeah the more complex our world gets the more complex then i think also the communication became uh which we needed to learn from others those really opaque things i hope this answers a bit the question all right thank you thank you so much dr heidler um dr pavlik i think um that could be the end of the Q&A. Um, we've learned a lot actually today. So. Yes, uh, absolutely. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Heidle. Uh, it, it was uh, for me also an, an incredible learning experience and, and to look at uh, so many uh, things that you presented in, in a different way. So I. I learned quite uh, quite a bit. I, of, of course, I, I, I'm aware of the importance and usefulness of, of fire as an, as an example, but uh, seeing it now at uh, such a, a wide and widely used multi-purpose tool, fire was actually, um, goes probably also beyond what, what I, imagined in, in my own work or in my own experiments. Um, of course, uh, we, we think of fires in, in, in the usual ways, but there are so many other activities which are not possible without fire mm -hmm. and which we do not relate uh, automatically with fire and the necessity of, of having fire. So, yes. Uh, Thanks again. Uh, this is great. We, we have uh, not really exceeded uh, our time, but we are now closing uh, the, the time slot of, of uh, our Zoom uh, meeting for today. So we, I think we have a lot of takeaways um, on the importance of, of social behavior, 
group activities that, and the, the combination and, and the possibilities of combining different tools, behaviors, and social interactions. And, and this is probably the, the secret that uh, made the recipe that made our species so successful in the end. So thanks again. And uh, we, we will uh, collect questions that are now coming in the chat box. And uh, of course, Dr. Heidle uh, will try to, to respond to them and then we make them available uh, as well. So thanks again and have a good time. See you at our next webinar, which is uh, next week on Tuesday, um, not Thursday, but the same time. And the speaker in next week's webinar will be Dr. Thomas Inchico from the National Museum of Natural History and the Musée de l'Homme in Paris, who will talk about early peopling of the Philippines who were they and how did they get there? Thank you very much and see you around. Thank you.